Hello everybody, my name is Tasman May from the channel Two Books and Tasman and welcome back to Penguin Platform. I am here today to talk to you about some of my favourite books and plays that are currently on the English Literature GCSE syllabus. I'm going to tell you why they're some of my favourite things ever, 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 and why you should be hella freaking excited to be studying the crap out of them. I loved all but one of the books that I studied at school. Now, I don't want this to come across as education at all. That is like the opposite of what I want. What I want this video to be is to be a hype up of books. You know that feeling you get when you and your mates go to the midnight viewing of the new Star Wars or Marvel film? <laughs> that. I want to give you that. Big task. Big task. I really, really love Marvel. But I love these bad boys just as much. Actually, you know what? I think I love Jane M more than Marvel. <gasps> wow. <laughs> I'm learning things about myself today, guys. Now, before we continue with our usual broadcasting. I want to interrupt with a little PSA. As I mentioned earlier, there was a book that I studied, it happened to be for English Literature A-Level, which I didn't vibe with at all. I'm not going to mention what it is because I didn't vibe with it, but that doesn't mean that you won't vibe with it. I don't want to put you off it. But I wanted to remind you that there are books that you're going to come across in your lifetime, be it in school or in your downtime, that you're not going to like and that is absolutely okay. And if you go open-mindedly into the books and plays I'm going to talk about now and still come out disliking them, that's okay. You are allowed your opinion. You, I mean I'm correct, but you are allowed your opinion. I really hate the stigma that schools these days put on reading well. I always have been such a massive reader, but even at the age of like 13, my teachers at school and my parents would scold me, I guess, for not reading enough classics, for not reading enough like literary fiction, for reading too much YA. And I'm like, dude, I was 13. Reading of any genre aimed at any age group is reading. Reading anything makes you a reader. Ran over, thank you for coming to my TED talk. On with the video. <laughs> The first book on my list is Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte. I relate to Jane so much. This is in the beautiful Penguin English Library Classics Edition. I have so many of them. It's a Victorian Gothic novel. It has a romance in it, and with it being a Gothic novel, there are elements of creepy, spooky, but not horror. People nearly die. Someone's out to kill some people. I actually only read Jane Eyre for the first time earlier this year. It's a story that I have grown up with. I read an abridged version when I was in primary school and have seen films and also the stage production by Bristol Old Vic and the National Theatre. If you can find it online anywhere, watch it because, ah, oh, amazing. But it is important to remember that adaptations aren't exactly the same, so like don't write your essays based off of Michael Fassbender. I listened to it on Audible, the version narrated by Tandy Newton. I've always loved the adaptations, but the book is so much better. I know everyone says that. Everyone always says that. It's true. Jane comes from a very wealthy family, but she is orphaned. And so she, at a young age, I think as a baby, moves in with her aunt, who has two kids. And those two kids are spoiled rotten. The boy physically hits Jane at one point and she's bleeding and then Jane gets punished for it. Then she gets sent off to boarding school. She meets a friend who has very different spiritual beliefs to her, which then stays with her throughout her whole life. Something that I really love about the book is the emphasis that it puts on her childhood. All of the adaptations that I've seen just skim past it. Your childhood years are so formative of who you are as a person. There is a teacher at the boarding school who is left out of all of the adaptations, who really takes care of her and helps nurture her. And she becomes the motherly, Figure that Jane never had. So the main chunk of the book takes place when Jane goes as a governess to the Rochester household, which has a name. It's called this. <laughs> Mr. Rochester has a ward called Adele. Jane is a mere lowly governess and he is a really rich and powerful and important person and when he eventually gets married he has to marry for status. This is the first time as Jane went to an all-girls school that she encounters a man, really. The first man that certainly takes any interest in her, that talks to her, and he sees her for who she is. He has a very troubled past, which once you've read Jane Eyre, if you enjoy it and you want to learn more about him, I highly recommend checking out Wide Sargasso Sea by Jean Rhys, which is a kind of prequel about some of Mr. Rochester's past. And he, in his broken self, sees some of himself from when he was younger in Jane. And so they start talking and they start developing feelings for each other. You can completely understand, I felt from reading the original text, why they both fell for each other. The older man who finally takes an interest in you when you have been told that you are nothing special your entire life. You can see why she falls for this guy who is a dick. One of my favorite scenes in the book is, I'm just gonna call it the fortune teller scene. It's so informative about how Mr. Rochester feels about Jane. He belittles everybody else in the room, which is everyone from 
his society. And he finally just expresses how he feels. In that scene, you really see how obsessed he is with her, how he needs her, and he needs to know how she feels about him. That scene really, when I was reading it, felt like a turning point, and I don't know why it isn't in any film or anything like that. A lot of the time, the main thing that Jane Eyre is in people's heads is a romance, and while that is a significant part of it, I feel like it is the saga of Jane's life. The visceral feeling I get in myself when I think about Jane Eyre is about how strong and powerful she is and she knows her place in society, she knows what everybody thinks of her, but she also knows that she wants bigger and better things. And when things don't go well for her, she's like, you know what? No. <laughs> I did have a cheeky little look on Spark Notes, which is just, you know, saved my education. And it pointed out that some of the main themes of the book are love and hate, social class, and self-discovery. Now, I always felt in school when I had an essay where I had to talk about themes, I was like, oh my god, I don't really know where the blah 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 blah. But you can basically just gush about the book. Like the love and hate can be referred to, obviously, Jane and Mr. Rochester. There's Helen Burns, who is Jane's best friend from when they were at school, and the abuse that was given to her by the Reeds, who are the family that raised Jane, and Mr. Brocklehurst, who was the head of the school that she went to. The social class aspect, I oh, I really want to talk about it more, but it's spoilery. Charlotte Charlotte Bronte really does a twisty boo at the end there. Very clever. If anyone wants to talk about it, spoilery stuff, let's chat in the comments. Let's do that. Let's do that. I don't want to include any spoilery things here. Another thing that I feel like young people like us would relate to is the self-discovery aspect of it. We follow Jane from childhood into early adulthood, especially as a young woman. And now I'm not saying that you have to be a girl in order to relate because that's just not true. All great pieces of art are for the masses for everybody. But the feelings that Jane has as a young girl in a low position in a man's world is so articulately described and I just want to like cover my body in tattoos of quotes from this book. Before I move on from this one though, there is a word that I learned because of spark notes and I saw it and I was like, what is that's not English? But I did a little Google and I had to get it to pronounce it for me and it is Bildungsroman which is a novel dealing with one person's formative years or spiritual education, which refers to both this and Doctor Strange, which is something else that I love. <laughs> so that's a clever little word that you can throw into an essay right there. Didn't know that word before now. If you can, I highly recommend the audiobook. I generally recommend audiobooks for all classics that people are daunted by. It makes it make sense. But I do genuinely mean it. Come talk to me in the comments about Jane Eyre because I just want to talk about her forever and always. Cool, thanks. The next book I'm going to talk about is one of my favourite plays ever, and that is Macbeth by Shakespeare. Don't run away! Listen, listen, I'm gonna make it sound not scary, I promise. Before I go into Macbeth, I'm gonna talk a little bit about Shakespeare and why I genuinely feel that it's still so important today. What I'm about to say actually applies to probably all of the books on here, and that is that books and art and any form of literature that lasts the tests of time has done so for a reason, and that is because generation after generation after generation, new people are still able to relate to it. So while Shakespearean language is scary, and that is something that you will need to learn and that I'm sorry there's nothing you can do but practice. Once you find a way to get past that and look at the story and the feelings, when you can get past the language, it's so relatable. The premise of Macbeth is there is a married couple and the guy is a bit of a pushover and the woman is a power hungry psychopath and she wants power and she will do anything to get it. She convinces her husband to kill the king when the king is chilling at their place one night. They frame the guards that were supposed to be protecting the king for it and then they rise to power. There is supernatural stuff to it as well. The three witches that come and tell the prophecies to Macbeth are just Mwah! But the main theme, I guess you'd say, for me is ambition and the analyzing of what humans, flawed real people will do to get what they want and the balance of what we expect versus what is real. For example, I, I kind of feel like I can spoil Macbeth because you know, it's kind of been around for thousands of years. Thousands? Hundreds. <laughs> Hundreds of years. I won't go into like exact plot points, but by the end of it, the crazy, savage Lady Macbeth is the one that is riddled with guilt and goes crazy. And Lord King Mr. Macbeth man is the one that gets so power hungry that that is then his demise. That is his fall down. Downfall! 
Yep, I personally first came across this when I was in year 8, so when I was about 12 years old we did a few scenes in English and I loved it straight away. It was my first encounter with Shakespeare. We did a bit with the Three Witches and it made me interested in the fantasy, the supernatural side of it. And then when I started at a GCSE I kind of understood it more on a, oh my god what's wrong with these people? Like how could you do that? It was like watching um, a, a documentary about a serial killer or something. And then later on when I went to drama school and I studied it, I then learned to study it from a human perspective. I slightly relate to the stabby stabby murder murder now, like in some instances I can condone that. Oh god I better not put that in the video. <laughs> I find it so interesting, any kind of form of media that deals with pushing people to the limits. There's a quote from one of my favourite books, Why Be Happy When You Could Be Normal, and that quote is, there are some people that cannot murder, I'm not one of those people, or something to that effect. <laughs> and when I read that, again, audiobook, amazing, I felt it. Obviously, ideally, never gonna be put in that position, but I read or watch Macbeth going, you know what? Mood. There are also some really, really incredible social media accounts, particularly on Twitter, Tumblr, Instagram, those sorts of things that do like, I, I call them literary lols. I will put some screenshots here because they're amazing and they make everything feel much more accessible. They take out the difficult language side and then they just go, these of these people with lots and lots of problems and aren't we all fucked up inside? Also, for those of you that didn't know, Shakespeare was bisexual. Or, you know, like what we would nowadays call bisexual. He was married to a woman and he had a family, but he had a lover who was a man and probably many other lovers of all of the genders. And that is definitely reflected in his work. Hamlet's very gay. If you want gay Shakespeare content, go for Hamlet. Shakespeare covers so many of the similar themes that he covers in this in all of his tragedies, like Julius Caesar, Hamlet, The Tempest, and Othello. According to Spark Notes, they are ambition, the supernatural, appearance versus reality, all of which we've talked about well done, Tasman. Oh, and here are some of my favourite editions of Macbeth, not only because the covers are pretty, but because they are recommended by certain theatre companies, by the National Theatre, or by the Royal Shakespeare Company. <laughs> the next book I'm going to be talking about is To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee. I read this in year nine and didn't do it for GCSE, which I'm very, very annoyed about. I have here the 50th anniversary cloth bound edition. I had a copy in school, which we borrowed from the school, so I haven't actually read this one, but it's pretty and I really love the book. So I was like, well, it can just look nice on my shelves. Thanks. So To Kill a Mockingbird came out in 1960 and it is set in the south of the United States, which is even to this day famously racist. It's narrated by Scout, who is a young girl, and I mean like a child, her brother Jem and her father Atticus. They're a white family, they have a black maid, and we see through Scout's innocent little child eyes and mind the story of a black man called Tom Robinson who is taken to court. He is accused of raping a white woman, and her father, who is white, is his defence lawyer. Again, I think like Jane Eyre, as I mentioned earlier, we've all been kids. We've all felt and seeing the world in a naive way. And her and her brother are being exposed to incredible racism and intolerance. And seeing it through the eyes of a white family who are liberal, especially for that area, who are taking aid to help this black man that has been wrongly accused, by the way, he didn't do the thing, is I think something that we can all relate to. We've all at some point heard something that we don't understand and you just feel completely overwhelmed because how on earth could someone not like someone for the color of their skin? How could someone Someone not like someone because of who they love, it just doesn't make sense. For example, recently I was having a conversation with my 11 year old niece about people that are trans and transphobia and she was like, I, but I don't understand why people are transphobic because before I didn't know that people could be transgender. But now that I know, like, they're still people. And that, I think, is perfectly summed up in this book. You really feel Scout's desperate need to understand people who have opposing views to her own and to also try and make the world a better place while being a kid and absolutely not being able to do that. Having said that, she does make an incredible difference at one point, which is one of my favourite, favourite sequences in the book. And it's when all of these white people come to Tom Robinson's house. They're like these really scary, big, angry, racist white men and they've got shotguns and stuff. Atticus is outside, he's like, you guys need to leave. And they're like, Atticus, get out of the way. We're gonna kill him. And the kids, not knowing what danger was happening, they just followed their dad. They rock up and she recognizes one of the men and she's like, oh, hi, sir. Yeah, I'm in class with your son. How is he? And the guy with the gun who was about to commit murder is just like, what do I do? what do I, this is an adorable innocent little girl and she knows my adorable innocent little boy and so they leave. 
they walk away. That is sort of a spoiler because it's not like near the beginning of the book or anything, but it's such a powerful moment that I felt the need to tell you because that is the sort of shit that will punch you in the guts with this book. There is another character called Boo Radley who is the local scary man. I don't know if you were all like this as well, but there was like that one haunted house on my street. I say haunted house as though that was a fact. There was a house on my street and it was number 13 and everyone was like, it's haunted, it's haunted. And that is how poor Boo Radley is demonized in this town. He is a man that we learn later on has immense trauma and mental health issues. But again, seeing it from the perspective of the children, it's a man that they've heard horror stories about. Then, in ways that I'm not going to tell because they're really lovely and they're spoilers, they learn that actually, they were actually prejudiced against him. And they were the ones that were intolerant and didn't take the time to learn about this man that had been ridiculed and humiliated by the rest of their town. And they were just helping perpetuate that. I will point out that this is very much a white saviour sort of story. Someone pointed out on Twitter recently and was like, it's bad because of this. But, and I'm saying this as a person of colour, obviously I'm not black, so it's not exactly the same, but it's historically accurate. We need own voices books. We obviously do not stand the white saviour complex. But in this situation, the only way that a black man who was on trial for the rape of a white woman was gonna be able to get out alive was if a white lawyer chose to defend him. Another really beautiful aspect of the book is the family side of everything. It's very, very family orientated. It's very much about a single father raising his kids and trying to lead by the best example. But not only in Atticus's household, but also the black families coming together to support Tom Robinson's wife called Helen while her husband has been taken to court and how they come together to make sure she's okay. One of the themes that we haven't yet touched on is courage. We have Atticus defending Tom Robinson, going against the status quo. Atticus is so ardently against guns, which again, the south of the states. No, 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 no. Having the guts to go against the people that you're similar to in race, in socioeconomic status, to stand up for other people. I want lots of Atticuses in the world. And my final note is Scout being a legend 24 seven. And that is a good way to wrap up that bit. The fourth and final thing that I'm going to talk about in this video is A View from the Bridge by Arthur Miller, which is a play that I studied for A-level drama, so I of course did look at it from an actor perspective as opposed to an analytical text perspective. But I want to hype up the story so you get excited for the story, so now we're going to talk about the story and why I love every single character, even the murderers. <laughs> This follows a family of Italian descent living in the US of A. It's incredibly naturalistic. They are really incredibly detailed, complex characters. There was a production of this starring Mark Strong as Eddie Carbone, the main male head of the family, and mwah! Oh my god! But I will point out, if you do see it, bear in mind that the way that it's produced is not the way that Arthur Miller intended. He very well would be turning in his grave if he were to see it now, because everything that Arthur Miller does is real life things. There's definitely a better word for that, but you know, you could ask your teacher and then let me know, please. <laughs> that production was very non-naturalistic. There we go. Oh, then the other word's probably naturalistic. I won't go into the plot per se because it's a very character driven play. It follows Eddie and his wife Beatrice, their niece Catherine. She has been raised by Eddie and Beatrice and she falls in love with Rodolfo. There's also another guy that comes with Rodolfo but I don't remember him and he's not very important to me. He's important in the story! Don't put that in an essay! I would say the most important thing is the emphasis that's put on moral versus martial law. So they're from an Italian descended family living in the States. There is the laws of the United States and then there is the moral law of the community, you know, like snitches get stitches sort of stuff. If someone hurts you and your family, you get revenge by hurting them and their family back. But even though the characters do do that, I still love them. They are not good people. Arthur Miller is such a goddamn genius that even the people that are incredibly morally flawed and manipulative and murderers, I just want to protect them. I just want to hug them and be like, hey, it's okay. You don't, you don't gotta do that. Eddie, the head of the household, is a macho stereotype. He works at the docks. Then there's Beatrice, who's the perfect little housewife. She's such an amazing maternal figure to Catherine. Catherine is out getting her first job. And she is learning to express herself and dabbling in maybe disobeying for the first time. Rodolfo is 
to effeminate what Eddie is to macho. The scene that sticks in my mind the most is when he puts on the vinyl and there's jazz and he's dancing and he's swinging Catherine around and it's in their like kitchen dining area. And they're all having a really great time except Eddie, who's there like, I'm the man of this house. You do not get to walk in here and sweep my niece off her feet, make my wife happy and smile and laugh when I'm just like losing myself at the bottom of a whiskey bottle every single night. Rodolfo also sews and like can make dresses and stuff and he is in touch with his feminine side in a way that Eddie just has never even considered and so when he sees that in Rodolfo he's disgusted by it. All forms of judgment come from a lack of understanding, they come from ignorance. I believe that any sort of prejudice, be it racism, homophobia, there is no sense behind it. And it's purely from a fear. And this is something that everyone can relate to. If you aren't like that yourself, then you've seen people that are like that. You have been to school, been to work, you've sat with them at the bloody Christmas table. This play is such a incredibly detailed analysis and study of human nature, masculinity, prejudice, sexuality, not in a like LGBT sense, but in a young woman learning about her body, themes of justice and the code of silence and familial love. There is another character that I forgot to mention because in my head I forget about him all the time, but it's very, very important, so especially for essays and stuff. He's called Alfieri and he's the narrator, he is the lawyer, and he is essentially telling us this story as we see it. So it cuts between him in his office and then the family home. He is the moral compass for the story. He shows the moral versus martial law and he shows the human side of Eddie. While he's becoming this monster, it shows that he just wants what's best for his family. It just is unfortunate that what he thinks is best for his family is absolutely the opposite of what is best for his family. I was about to say it's relatable, I certainly bloody hope it isn't because it is traumatic. But like Jane Eyre and the Shakespeare and Harper Lee's book, it is relatable on a human level. Wow, have I just made an incredible link back around for all of these? that I didn't even realise as a conclusion for the video. <gasps> a View From The Bridge, like all of the others, are about humanity. They are all to do with what humans do when pushed to the extreme, when we're put in excruciating circumstances that by God I hope nobody watching this video ever has to go through. And that's why these books and these plays stand the test of time, because they are about us. And even if us were born a thousand years ago, the people involved are always humans. That's why I love books, man. Like I mentioned earlier with Jane Eyre, but this applies to all of them, please do come chat to me in the comments about them. Again, if you're scared, watch adaptations, listen to the audiobook. Remember if you watch adaptations that it is not going to be the same as the original text, but it is a good way to get you introduced to it so that you know what is coming, so that you can get attached to the characters, so when you eventually read the Shakespeare play, it'll at least make more sense. I really, really, really hope you enjoy them. I hope you've had a really good time. I have. I certainly have. Ah! I want to do this more. Leave a comment down below if you liked it to get Penguin Platform to make me come back to do more videos like this, yay! <laughs> Thank you all so much. I hope you're all safe and well and that you put your health at just a high priority as your studies. Remember to stay inside, stay safe, look after your family, message your mum if you haven't recently, tell your grandma that you love her and take care.